Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am pleased to welcome you to our inaugural in-house speaker series. Throughout the year, the in-house team will invite guests into our company, into Fannie Mae, um, to talk about the most pressing, innovative, challenging issues that face housing. Our goal is to make sure that we're trying to figure out not just what the issues are, but what the actions should be to deal with those issues. I can think of no better speaker to launch this series than Richard Rothstein, the author of The Color of the Law, of Law. It is a book that really discusses not private actions that cause discrimination in housing, but the federal government's actions that cause discrimination in housing. And I can tell you when I was reading the book, I really felt the personal connection between the facts of the book and the facts of my individual life. And for those of you who grew up in similar circumstances, I'm sure if you've read the book, you felt that um, as, as well. Uh, Richard is a renowned columnist, or former columnist of the New York Times. Um, currently serves as the Distinguished Fellow at the Economic Policy Institute um, at the Thurgood Marshall Institute at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, is just a fabulous person to talk to, and I've had the opportunity to talk to him a little bit um, before this time. And so I want to welcome and please give a warm welcome to Richard Rostin. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, and thanks to all of you for uh, coming here this afternoon to engage in this conversation with me. As you all know, um, in the 20th century, we had a civil rights movement in this country. Uh, it began with uh, civil rights lawyers challenging segregation in law schools because they figured if judges weren't smart enough to figure out anything else, they might be able to figure out that you couldn't get a good legal education in a segregated law school. And then they used that precedent to challenge segregation in colleges and universities, and then went on, as you all know, in 1954 to challenge segregation in elementary and secondary schools, legal segregation in Brown versus Board of Education. And then that Brown decision inspired many people in this country and reinvigorated an already beginning civil rights movement that went on in the 1960s using not only litigation, and not only legislation, but marches and demonstrations and civil disobedience. Some people lost their lives and eventually eliminated segregation in this country in everything from water fountains to buses, you all know the Rosa Parks story, to uh, lunch counters, uh, to uh, interstate transportation of all kinds. And then at the end of the 1960s, uh, the civil rights movement uh, sort of went away. It folded up tent, went home, and left unaddressed the biggest segregation of all. It understood that segregation, racial segregation, was wrong, that it was immoral, that it was unconstitutional, that it was incompatible with our self-conception of a constitutional democracy, that it was harmful to both African Americans and to whites, and yet it left untouched the biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. I've lived in many of them. Uh, all of them that I've lived in had neighborhoods that were either all white or mostly white, neighborhoods that were either all black or mostly black. How did this happen? How is it that we left untouched this major, biggest form of segregation? None of us think it's a good thing. We all think it's too bad we have this segregation, but there's been no civil rights movement to challenge it. We tried to do nothing about it. And I, I puzzled about this for a long time. Uh, how is it that we made a commitment to abolish racial segregation and we still have an apartheid society when it comes to where people live? And in some ways it's not hard to understand. Uh, it's a lot harder to desegregate neighborhoods, as you all know, than it is to desegregate water fountains. You desegregate water fountains and the next day people can drink from any water fountain. You desegregate neighborhoods and the next day things don't look much different. And so what we've done, all of us, include myself, uh, liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, Northerners, Southerners, 
what we've done, all of us, is we've adopted a national rationalization, an excuse that we all tell ourselves that excuses ourselves from stepping up to our responsibilities as American citizens and remedying this enormous civil rights violation of segregation in, in housing. The, the, res the, the rationalization, the excuse goes something like this. All those other forms of segregation that we abolished, whether it was anything from water fountains all the way up to law schools, those were government created, government required, either by state or federal or local ordinance. Uh, and if it's government required segregation, well, that violates, depending on the level of government, either the fifth or the 14th. And if you read my book, you'll also conclude that it violates the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves, wasn't created by government. Residential segregation just sort of happened. It happened because of private activity. It happened because oh, homeowners in white neighborhoods wouldn't sell homes to African Americans. Or maybe real estate agents and, and bankers and operating in the private economy not acting on behalf of government, discriminated in the way in which they showed homes or rented apartments or issued mortgages. Or maybe it happened because, well, blacks and whites just like to live with each other. The blacks like to live with blacks, whites like to live with blacks, it's self-segregation. Or maybe it happened for oh, economic and demographic reasons. Uh, uh, African Americans typically have, on average, not always, but on average, lower incomes than whites and they can't often afford to live in predominantly white neighborhoods. All of these non-governmental decisions and actions, uh, private, uh, private activity is what created residential segregation. And if it happened by accident, it can only happen by accident. It's not our responsibility to do anything about it. Well, <coughs> as Jeffrey mentioned, I, I was a, a columnist in the New York Times for a while. I spent most of my career writing about education policy. I was the education columnist. Um, didn't know much about housing, still don't. Um, I'm still learning. Um, but uh, I was writing about education policy and I came to understand in the work I did on education that um, this was, a, and you know, maybe some, some of you are familiar with this, in the um, 1990s and 2000s we had a national policy which said that the only reason that there was what we call an achievement gap between African American and white children, lower average achievement for African Americans and whites is because teachers had low expectations of African American children and didn't really try hard enough. And so we adopted a national law called No Child Left Behind, which said that uh, teachers had to be held accountable for equalizing the achievement of uh, African Americans and whites at very high levels. And any uh, explanation besides teacher accountability was just a form of making excuses for poor performance on the part of educators. And I wrote many, many columns trying to attack that view, uh, explain why it was misguided. And I began to describe condition after condition of, of lower class children, minority children, low income children, in particular African American, low income children, that made it inevitable that their achievement was going to be lower no matter how high teacher expectations were, no matter how, quali how highly qualified high quality the schools and classrooms that they attended were. So I won't go into much of it because that's not what this, this talk is about. But for example, we know that urban African American children typically have, as have asthma at four times the rate of middle class children. And if a child has asthma, quite frequently the child is up at night wheezing, comes to school drowsy the next day, uh, maybe sleepless, maybe even absent from school. Asthma is a big cause of chronic ab school absenteeism. And I tried to explain that if you had two groups of children who are equal in every respect, identical, same race, same socioeconomic conditions, same parental uh, qualifications and, and experience, two groups of children equal in every respect, if we, except one group had a higher rate of asthma than the other, that group was going to have lower average achievement because that group on average was going to come to school drowsier and more sleepless. And it doesn't mean that some children with asthma don't have higher achievement than typical children without because as you know, there's a distribution of outcomes for every human characteristic. But on average, if a child doesn't come to school well rested, it's gonna make a difference. And I went through condition after condition like this, uh, whether it was asthma or lead poisoning or uh, stress from uh, economic insecurity or homelessness, 
and try to explain it. When you add all of these conditions up, they explain the achievement gap. Uh, not all of it, but most of it. But then I began to realize, it took me a while, I'm, I'm a slow learner. Um, I began to realize that it's one thing if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or stress. It's another thing if you have a school where every single child has these one or more of these conditions. How is a school ever with those kinds of concentrations of disadvantage ever going to achieve at the same level as schools where all children come to school well rested and secure and in stable homes and healthy? Well, we call those schools, as you know, segregated schools. And schools today are more segregated than they have been at any time in the last 25 years. It's the main cause of the ongoing achievement gap in our schools. And so I began to wonder how the schools came to be segregated and what we could do about it. And then in 2007, I read a Supreme Court decision uh, which evaluated um, a program that two school districts had, uh, Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Kentucky. Both of these districts had trivial, trivial school desegregation plans. They were well-intended but you couldn't imagine more trivial plans. Both of them allowed parents and, and the children to choose which school and district they would go to, but if the parent's choice would uh, minimize segregation, that choice would be honored in favor of a choice of a child that would exacerbate segregation. So if you had a school that was all white or mostly white and there was one place left, and both a black and a white child applied for that last place, the black child would be given some preference. Couldn't have imagined a more trivial program. How often do you have one place left and both a black and white child apply for it? But the Supreme Court was outraged. They said that Louisville and Seattle could not do this. Uh, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the opinion and he explained that this kind of policy violated the Constitution because, he said, the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. I thought that was a pretty wise observation. I mean, Chief Justice's part, uh, it's in fact why they're segregated. But then he went on to say that the, school, that the neighborhoods in Louisville and Seattle are segregated because, the neighbor, because of de facto reasons, because of private activity. Government had nothing to do with it because of all the things I just mentioned, private discrimination and economic discrimination of the private economy and people's choices to live on, a, on one another the same race and economic differences. And he said, if you have de facto segregation, in Seattle and Louisville, there's nothing that not only you can do it, there's nothing you can be permitted to do it. You can't take race into account to remedy something that the government hadn't created. Well, as you can tell by looking at me, I've been around for a while, and uh, I remembered a case in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the districts that was uh, the subject of this decision, in which um, a white homeowner in a single family home in Louisville, in, in a suburb of Louisville, the suburb was called Shively, maybe some of you know Louisville, um, had a friend who was an African American decorated Navy veteran. Uh, the, the friend was living in the downtown area of Louisville in a rented apartment. He wanted, had a wife and a daughter, a good job, good income, wanted to move to a single family home like his friends had, but nobody would sell him a home. So the white homeowner, bought another home in this suburb of Shively and resold it to his African-American friend uh, so he could move to a single family home. And when the African-American friend moved in, a mob, an angry white mob surrounded the home, protected by the police. Uh, they threw rocks through the windows, even though the police were there in, in presence. Uh, they couldn't identify a single perpetrator. Uh, the mob then firebombed and dynamited the home. And when this riot was all over, nobody was arrested. The, the, the police couldn't identify a single perpetrator except for one person. The white homeowner was arrested, tried, uh, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year jail sentence for sedition. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police and the criminal justice system and the courts, the prosecutors are all being used to enforce racial boundaries, even with violence, if necessary. And so I began to wonder whether this was just an isolated incident or whether there was a more systematic combination of both federal, state, and local policies that created residential segregation, giving the lie to the myth of de facto segregation. And as you know, uh, 
what I concluded was that, in fact, we do have a history of systematic federal, state, and local policy designed to create, reinforce, and perpetuate uh, racial segregation to ensure that African Americans and whites could not live near one another in any metropolitan area. De facto segregation is an other myth. There's no reality to it whatsoever. And if I'm right about this, and I'm convinced I'm right, uh, uh, and I think you will be too when you um, read my book or hear what I have to say, then it's a violation of the Constitution. It's a civil rights violation. Our racial boundaries are a civil rights violation. As much as segregated buses or water fountains or lunch counters were, and if it's a civil rights violation, all of us, not just institutions like Fannie Mae, but all of us as individuals, as American citizens, have an obligation to do something about it if we're going to stand up and call ourselves citizens of a constitutional democracy. So let me spend a few minutes um, today describing some of the major policies that the federal, state, and local governments follow in order to ensure racial segregation in society. I'll begin by talking about public housing. Some of you may know this history, but I'll bet most of you don't. Um, most of you, like me, think of public housing, as I used to think of public housing, as a place where poor people lived. Single mothers with children, lots of them. Uh, young men without jobs in the formal economy, engaged in uh, oppositional behavior, attracting the attention of the police, sometimes violent consequences, uh, deteriorated buildings. That's our image of public housing. That's not how public housing began in this country. The first civilian public housing in this country was built during the Great Depression in the New Deal by one of the first New Deal agencies in the Roosevelt administration, the Public Works Administration. It built public housing in many, many cities around this country. And everywhere it built housing, it built segregated housing, frequently creating segregation where segregation hadn't previously existed. Now that may, may surprise some of you as well, but in the mid-early 20th century, there were many integrated working class neighborhoods in downtown areas of cities all across the country. We would be stunned if we were transported back there to see the extent of integration there was. I'm not suggesting that the entire country was integrated, certainly a lot of informal segregation, but many cities had integrated neighborhoods for the simple reason that factories, warehouses, the service industries that, that supported them all had to be located near deep water ports on a river or maybe a railroad terminal where they could get their parts and ship their final products. And the workers who worked in these factories in the single uh, concentrated downtown employment district didn't have automobiles to get to work, so they had to live close enough to be able to get to work by walking or maybe taking very short street streetcar rides. So in many areas of the country, surrounding the downtown industrial area were integrated neighborhoods where African Americans and Polish workers and Irish workers and Jewish workers and Rural migrants were all working and walking to work. Uh, the great African-American novelist, the poet, the playwright Langston Hughes, I, I hope many of you are familiar with him. Uh, he wrote an autobiography called The Big C. In his autobiography, um, he described how he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. We don't think of downtown Cleveland as being integrated today, but he says he grew up in an integrated neighborhood. He says his best friend in high school was Polish. He dated a Jewish girl in high school. Again, I'm not suggesting that this was the norm, but it was not nearly so unique as it is today. And the Public Works Administration went into that downtown Cleveland neighborhood, called the Central Neighborhood of Cleveland, demolished integrated housing, and built two separate projects, one for African Americans and one for whites, creating a pattern of segregation with that and with other projects elsewhere in the uh, Cleveland area, also segregated that reinforced whatever tendencies of segregation existed in Cleveland and created it where it hadn't yet existed. And as I say, this went on all over the country. In my book, The Color of Law, that I, I guess many of you have, um, I like to, to focus on self-satisfied, smug places, uh, like Cambridge, Massachusetts, for example, uh, places that think they're, they're better than the rest of us. And um, uh, the, the, the neighborhood between Harvard and MIT, called the Central Square neighborhood. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. In the 1930s, it was about half black and half white. The Public Works Administration demolished housing in that neighborhood to build two separate projects, one for African Americans and one for whites, creating a pattern of segregation in the Boston metropolitan area, which didn't have nearly the informal segregation that places like Cleveland might have had, creating a pattern of segregation with those projects and others in the Boston metropolitan area that created the racial boundaries that we know in Boston today. And this went on, as I say, all over the country. During World War II, 
hundreds of thousands of workers flocked to centers of war production to take jobs in war industries, war production industries uh, that um, didn't exist during the Depression. And they overwhelmed the communities where these war plants were located. And if the government wanted the ships and the planes and the tanks and the jeeps to be produced, it had to somehow find housing for these workers. And it did. Everywhere, it built segregated housing to take to account for this massive migration of workers to cities and war production, frequently creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed or reinforcing segregation where it did exist. Another place I describe in, in my book is a, a suburb of Berkeley, California, uh, a place called Richmond. It was the center of shipbuilding on the West Coast, a tiny community, had no shipyards uh, before the war. By the end of the war, it was employing 100,000 workers, migrant workers, um, uh, who came there with their families. Uh, how does a community, a tiny community like that, absorb, what, two, 300,000 people in just four years? Couldn't be done unless the government built housing. And the government did build housing for the war workers. It built housing for the African-American workers uh, along the railroad tracks and in the industrial area running down through Richmond and Berkeley uh, and Oakland. And it built housing for the white workers, separate housing in the more residential areas and, uh, with access to shopping and amenities. Uh, the city of Richmond actually made an announcement that it didn't have to build uh, uh, sta stable housing for the African-American workers because they'd have to leave Richmond at the end of the war. Uh, the white workers would be um, uh, welcome to stay. This also went on all over the country, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, um, historians like to divide up the migration of African Americans from the South to the North into two great periods. Uh, the first great migration is the migration that took place around World War I for similar reasons. The second great migration is the migration that took place uh, in World War II uh, to work in the war industries. There were very few African Americans on the West Coast um, as a result of the first Great Migration. They only came in large numbers during the second Great Migration. So there were no incipient patterns of segregation on the West Coast prior to World War II. The segregation that we now know in places like Portland and Seattle and the San Francisco Bay Area and Los Angeles is all the result of this government policy for World War II workers to create segregated patterns where it hadn't previously existed. After World War II, there was still an enormous housing shortage in this country. Um, not only had there been no housing built in the Depression except for these few public projects, and during World War II, it was actually prohibited to build civilian housing. Uh, you couldn't use materials for civilian construction unless it was for war workers. Um, and then we had millions of returning war veterans, as you know, uh, uh, coming home, having the baby boom, needing a place to live. Um, it was an enormous housing crisis. People, black and white, living in open fields in Quonset huts, doubled and tripled up with relatives. No housing was available for workers. I should say that the, when I, uh, the ha public housing I've talked about before, whether it was um, for workers in downtown factory districts or workers in World War II, this was not subsidized housing. Public housing was not subsidized at this time in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, workers paid the full cost of the housing in their rent. The government advanced the money for construction, but the housing was self-supporting. The reason it was built was not to provide housing for poor people. Poor people weren't permitted to live in public housing. It was to provide housing for people who could afford housing, but for whom none was available. So President Truman, after World War II, proposed a vast expansion of this public housing program for returning war veterans, people who had jobs in the post-war economy. Again, self-supporting projects. This is the most important story I'm going to tell you this afternoon, what follows, and I hope you'll, you'll pay careful attention to it because it has enormous implications for what you at Fannie Mae and indeed everybody in the housing industry does today. President Truman proposed a vast expansion of the national public housing program. Conservatives in Congress wanted to defeat Truman's national public housing program. They proposed to do so with a poison pill amendment. Um, this is a strategy that opponents of the bill use in Congress where they propose an amendment to a bill which they think can gain a majority, but then when the full bill as amended comes up to the floor of Congress with this amendment, it becomes unpalatable to a different majority and it goes down to defeat. So conservatives in Congress propose an amendment to the 1949 Housing Act. They want to defeat public housing. They thought it was socialistic. Propose an amendment saying that from now on, 
Public housing has to be integrated. No more racial discrimination in public housing. Uh, it was a cynical move. They didn't want public housing at all, but they planned to vote for this amendment. They planned to get northern liberal Democrats, some of them, not all of them, to vote for it as well. That would create a majority to get the amendment passed. And then when the full bill as amended as an integrated program came before Congress, the conservatives planned to flip and vote against the bill. They would be joined by southern Democrats who were opposed to uh, integrated housing, but we're all, we're all for segregated housing, and the entire bill will go down to defeat. So liberals in Congress had a difficult decision to make. What were they going to do about this amendment? There was an enormous housing crisis. I don't minimize the difficulty of the decision they had to face. Enormous housing crisis, as I say, people living in open fields and Quonset huts, uh, black and white. Um, were they going to support the integration amendment and ensure that no housing would be built? To, to solve this housing crisis? Or were they going to oppose the integration amendment in order to get more public housing, albeit on a segregated basis? Well, they made the latter choice. The most uh, uh, prominent liberal in the United States Congress that at that time was uh, Paul Douglas, a, uh, 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 a senator from Illinois. He got up on the floor of Congress and made a speech along the following lines. I want to say to my Negro friends, Senator Douglas said, that you will get more housing if the integration amendment is defeated than you will get if the integration amendment is passed and you get no housing at all. And he persuaded his liberal colleagues, all of these, uh, many of them are known as civil rights advocates to vote against the integration amendment. The integration amendment was defeated. The federal government used the defeat of that amendment as its justification for continuing to segregate all federal housing programs, not just public housing, for the next 15 years. And with this amendment, all of the giant projects that we're familiar with uh, uh, as public housing, whether it's the Robert Taylor Homes or Fabrini Green in Chicago or Pruitt Igo in St. Louis, were constructed all on a segregated basis. We talk about Pruitt Igo, you're probably familiar with that, that project. It was two projects, it wasn't one project. Pruitt was for African Americans, Igo was for whites. And very soon thereafter, after all these projects were built, and remember, for working class families, people who could afford rent, a development occurred everywhere in the country which was quite surprising. And that is that all of the white projects developed large numbers of vacancies. All of the black projects had long waiting lists. Soon the situation became so conspicuous and untenable, even the most bigoted public housing official couldn't justify uh, running a, a system where he had some projects that were virtually empty and others with long waiting lists. So all the projects were opened up to African Americans. But then something else happened at about the same time in this country. As the projects were becoming all African American, whites were, were depopulating these projects, the industry that I talked about before that had to be located near deep water ports or near railroad terminals left the cities and moved to suburbs or rural areas because the highways were being built and they could get their parts and ship their final products that way. So jobs disappeared from the urban areas where the public housing was being built. The African Americans who were now predominant in public housing became poorer and poorer with less access to good jobs. The government began subsidizing the housing. Uh, once they began subsidizing the housing, they uh, did less maintenance. The projects deteriorated. They became the kind of urban slums that we know today. Public housing officials made a well-intentioned decision, which is probably one of the greatest misjudgments, policy misjudgments, I think, in, in American social history. Public housing officials looking at the enormous housing crisis that African Americans were facing, because even though opening, even opening up the white projects to African Americans didn't minimize the long waiting lists, decided that Anybody who could afford to pay for housing, remember public housing originally was only for people who could afford to pay for it. Anybody who had, could afford to pay for housing would be evicted to make room for poor people who couldn't afford to pay for housing. So all middle class families, working class families, black and white who remained, were evicted from public housing and public housing became the concentration of poor people that we know today and that are uh, uh, dysfunctional communities. Well. The question you should ask is why um, uh, uh, did the, all the vacancies occur in the white projects? And that's because of another federal program that was even more powerful in segregating the country than the public housing program that I've described so far. That was a program of the Federal Housing Administration. 
that was explicitly designed, it was a racially explicit program to uh, suburbanize the white population that lived in cities into single family homes in the suburbs. Uh, this was not uh, an implicit effect of a program, it was a racially explicit program. And you're familiar with all the suburbs that were created, all the suburbs in this country that, that were created in the 1940s and 50s, even into the 60s with this racial program. Uh, the biggest one, the most famous, is probably Levittown, east of New York City. Uh, you've all familiar with that, you've all heard that, heard of that. But uh, maybe some of you remember um, a song that Pete Seeger used to sing about the little boxes on a hillside, and they were ticky tacky and they all looked the same. Uh, that was a development just as large as Levittown, also a racially exclusive program uh, development uh, by the Federal Housing Administration just south of San Francisco in a community called Daly City. And there were thousands of these developments in between, between New York and, and San Francisco. Levittown was 17,000 homes. Uh, the Daly City project is about the same size. Where, does it, where was the developer? There was no Fannie Mae then, I guess, uh, uh, helping him out. Uh, where was a developer like Levittown uh, going to uh, get the capital to build 17,000 homes in one place for which he had no buyers? Purely speculative venture. No bank would be crazy enough to lend him the money to build 17,000 homes in one place. He had no buyers. He needed money to buy the land to construct the buildings. This wasn't uh, insuring mortgages. The only way he could do it was by going to the Federal Housing Administration, submitting his plans for the development, making a commitment to the Federal Housing Administration that we'd never sell a home to an African American, even acceding to a Federal Housing Administration explicit requirement that he place a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. This was not the action of rogue bureaucrats in the FHA. This was uh, written out in a, in a federal policy manual uh, 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 that the, was, was distributed to appraisers around the country whose job it was to recommend um, whether a, a developer's proposal should be uh, submitted to the uh, FHA for an insured um, uh, uh, loan. Uh, the federal policy manual said that um, uh, no home, no, no a proposal of a developer could be um, uh, insured by the federal government if it was for an integrated development. The manual went so far to say you couldn't even insure an all white development if it was going to be located near where African Americans were living. Because in the words of the Federal Policy Manual, and I'm quoting, it would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. This was explicit language in the underwriting manual of the Federal Housing Administration. Where did this notion of de facto housing uh, discrimination come from? De facto segregation come from? It's an utter myth. Well, these two programs, uh, the, the public housing program, the uh, FHA suburbanization of the white population on an explicit, racially explicit basis, along with many, many other programs such as the police-sponsored violence, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, use of the Internal Revenue Service to grant tax exemptions to institutions that were uh, active and, and public and trying to segregate their communities, the licensing of real estate agents uh, who uh, promoted segregation, the National Association of Real Estate Boards in those times, had a code of ethics that prohibited, prohibited real estate agents from selling homes to African Americans in the white community. And licenses of real estate agents were lifted if they violated that code. And every state license agency in the country embraced that code when they licensed real estate agents. These were violations of the 14th Amendment. Well, we had this system, an entire system of uh, de jure segregation, as the courts would say, uh, not de facto segregation that created the racial boundaries that we know in this country today. And what are the consequences? Well, consider the developments like Levittown, the sub suburbs that I just described. In those days, they were very modest homes, uh, 750 square feet typically in all of these developments across the country. Um, they sold in those days for about $9,000, $10,000. In, in today's inflation-adjusted money, that's about $100,000. Any working class family, black or white, can afford to buy a home for $100,000, uh, especially in those days because no down payment was required if you were a veteran, and that's who most of these uh, homes went to. Um, today, as you know, these homes and all of these developments sell for what, $300,000, $400,000, $500,000, and some developments even more. The white families who are subsidized by the federal government, I say subsidized because with an FHA or VA mortgage, 
They could pay less in their monthly housing costs in these all-white developments than they were paying for rent and public housing. Um, the white families who were subsidized uh, in this racial program uh, were um, gained uh, over the next few generations wealth from the equity appreciation in their homes, 200, 300, 400 thousand dollars, maybe more. They used that wealth to send their children to college. They used it to finance temporary bouts of unemployment or, or medical emergencies. Uh, they used it to subsidize their retirements. And they used it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren who then had down payments for their own homes. Today, African American incomes, on average, are about 60%, 60% of white incomes. So that's a disparity, it's a big disparity. It's another story, I won't bore you with another lecture right now about how that disparity took place. But it's a 60% income ratio. You would think that the 60% income rate ratio would translate into a 60% wealth ratio. People at the same income level should have the same, uh, roughly same wealth. In fact, average African American wealth is 10% of white wealth in this country today. And that enormous disparity, the enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 10% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid 20th century and has never been remedied, never even attempted to be remedied. Well, that wealth ratio determines much of the racial inequality that we have in this country today. And the, the racial inequality translates into all kinds of dysfunction and social problems that we have. Racial segregation of neighborhoods, unconstitutional racial segregation of neighborhoods, determines, underlies most of the most, our most serious social problems. I already described how it underlies the achievement gap in schools. Who knows how much effort we've spent in the last 20 or 30 years trying to close the achievement the gap in schools fruitlessly, made virtually no progress in doing so, and never dealing with the underlying cause, which is the fact that the schools, as Justice Roberts so wisely opined, are located in segregated neighborhoods. It underlies the health crises that we face, the public health officials craze, uh, cr face. African Americans have lower life expectancies, uh, higher rates of heart disease because they live in so many of them, not all of them, but so many of them live in more polluted neighborhoods, less healthy neighborhoods. It certainly underlies the tragedies of our criminal justice system. We would not have the disproportionate placement of, of young African American men in prisons and jails uh, uh, if it were not for the fact that we were concentrating. The most disadvantaged young men in neighborhoods where the jobs have disappeared, uh, where they have little access to high performing schools or to uh, not only to jobs, but to the transportation to get to those jobs. And I'd suggest further that um, the racial segregation that we have uh, today, that's a legacy of our unconstitutional policies, underlies the very dangerous political polarization that we're experiencing in this country. Uh, it's frightening, I'm frightened by it, and you all know that while it's not a direct correlation, the political polarization that we experience tracks racial lines fairly closely. And I don't see how we're ever going to overcome this polarization, which threatens our very existence as a democratic society, if so many African Americans and whites live so far distant from each other that they have no ability to understand, to empathize with each other's life experiences, or to um, develop a, a common national identity, which has to be the foundation of a democratic society. So the residential segregation that we've created, our government has created, um, uh, is, is a, continues to be a terrible danger to us today. There are many, many solutions. As I started out by saying, I'm not a housing expert. Uh, I'm being forced to learn more than I ever wanted to know about housing. Uh, I, thought I wrote a book of history, not of, but uh, the policies to remedy this are easy to develop. They're easy to think about. Um, what is difficult is developing the political will to implement them, um, and uh, that's the challenge we face. So we could spend a lot of time talking about policy, and I can give you examples of, for example, um, uh, this is actually, a, you know, Elizabeth Warren put this into a bill and it's before the Senate now. I, I think it's entirely politically unrealistic, and I'd rather see her go around the country making speeches about this problem than trying to put forward legislation that has no chance of passing, but of subsidizing African Americans 
to buy homes in suburbs that they otherwise cannot afford today, but which they could have afforded um, uh, had they been permitted when these racial policies were, were implemented. And that kind of a subsidy would be a narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation. If this history were understood, any court would accept that as a remedy. It's very narrowly targeted. If you live in a red line neighborhood, you're entitled to a subsidy to buy a home uh, in a, in anywhere you want in a metropolitan area. There are many, many other policies that we have. We have policy, we continue to subsidize single family homeowners in uh, communities that maintain zoning ordinances that exclude um, uh, single family homes on small lot sizes or townhouses or um, uh, scatter site of, of public apartments. Um, we subsidize those single family homeowners, as you know, with a mortgage interest deduction. We could use that as leverage. We could tell families, uh, single family homeowners, that uh, we'll put your mortgage interest deductions in escrow until your community modifies its zoning ordinance to permit it to be integrated. That would be something that we could do. We have programs that you all know about at the low end for the low income housing tax credit and uh, the Section 8 voucher program, which reinforce segregation today. Uh, they're not racially explicit. They don't have to be. We've already created the segregated structure upon which these uh, programs operate. But developers would much rather build a low income housing development in an already low income neighborhood because they don't have to have 100 community meetings explaining why they're bringing brown and black people into your neighborhood and the, uh, the land is cheaper. Uh, the Federal Treasury Department's regulations, as you know, even place a priority in placing low-income housing in already low-income communities. That's a, a program that could be modified. So there are many, many policies that we could follow. Um, I, I, perhaps in the question period and the answer period, we can talk about more of them. Uh, the important thing, though, is that we understand our, our constitutional obligation as American citizens to do something about it, because until we have a national consensus that motivates us, not everybody, but just as the civil rights movements of past decades uh, developed an effective movement to demand change, until we have that effective movement, we're not going to be able to move forward to developing any of the policies which are so essential to meet our responsibilities as American citizens. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.